Today's session, as I mentioned before, is entitled International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights in the Context of Armed Conflict. We have a number of learning session, learning objectives for today's sessions. And again, for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, PHAP provides learning objectives at the start of each one of these sessions in an attempt to ensure accountability on our part to make sure that we provide you with the scope of information and knowledge that we think is important to have a, a fundamental grasp of the topic at hand. So today's learning objectives are to facilitate a basic understanding of the similarities and differences between IHL and human rights law, including the circumstances under which each applies, the jurisdictional scope of each framework, and the key substantive provisions. We also hope that you'll leave today's session with a familiarity with the varied and sometimes highly contradictory positions that states have adopted in regards to the relationship between IHL and human rights law. We also intend to cover the normative relationship between IHL and human rights and the, ap and the application of the principle of lex specialis, which is often cited in this context. We hope you also will have a familiarity with the debate concerning the question of extraterritorial application of human rights and an appreciation of the practical consequences of the different perspectives concerning the engagement between IHL and human rights law. There will be um, an assessment at the end of this available for PHAP members. And so we would invite you uh, to participate in this assessment. The code will be provided at the end of the session. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor John Cerrone, and John will take us through today's session. About the interrelate between humanitarian law and human rights law in situations of armed conflict or occupation. We'll start off by defining these terms. What is humanitarian law? What is human rights law? How are they different from other bodies of public international law? First off, international humanitarian law, as we all know, is the law of armed conflict. Law of armed conflict being a synonym for international humanitarian law. Another term we use is the Latin term, the use in bello, to be distinguished from the use ad bellum. So the use in bello, the law in war, as opposed to the use ad bellum, the law of going to war. The former use in bello, humanitarian law, law of armed conflict, all the same thing. Use ad bellum, international law governing recourse to the use of armed force between states. So what is humanitarian law? What is the law of armed conflict? As I'm sure everybody already knows, the rules of international law regulate situations of armed conflict or occupation once they've begun. So these are the rules that regulate the conduct of the hostilities, the methods and means of warfare, and that protect certain groups of individuals who are not taking part in the hostilities or are no longer taking part in the hostilities. So what's human rights law? Human rights law essentially rules of international law that impose obligations on states to secure the rights of those that are under their jurisdiction. So human rights law essentially rules of international law binding states, and this supports with the traditional role of international law imposing obligations on states, but innovative in that the rights holder under human rights law is the individual human being. So human rights law confers legal rights on individual human beings. This is not consistent with our traditional structure of international law, so very innovative post-World War II. And these rights that are conferred on individual human beings are conceived of as human rights, the idea being that individuals have these rights simply by virtue of being human. That's the conception, of course. That's not the legal reality, but it is the conception underlying human rights, this universality of, of human rights. Finally, I want to say a few words about international criminal law because it's sometimes conflated with these other two. International criminal law can be used in a broad sense or in a narrow sense. Broadly, international criminal law would refer to any rules of international law that concern all justice matters, including mutual legal assistance and extradition and suppression treaties, any rules of international law that touch upon these criminal justice matters. International criminal law in the strict sense or in the narrow sense 
would be just those rules of international law, the breach of which gives rise to individual criminal responsibility. And here, we're generally talking about these core international crimes of war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, and possibly also aggression, although you're probably aware there's some controversy still around uh, the crime of aggression as, an, as a crime in the, in the strict sense in international criminal law. <clears throat> So the definitions that I'm stipulating are technical definitions, and I'm setting them for uh, the sake of making sure that we're understanding each other when we use these terms. There can be disagreement about the outer contours of these definitions, so I'm stipulating them so that you'll know what I'm talking about when I refer to human law versus law of armed conflict versus international criminal law in the strict sense. So what are the sources of international human rights law obligations? Well, essentially the same as the sources of international law generally. Treaties, customary law, general principles of law, of course, we're familiar with these sources that are set forth in Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice as the applicable law before the ICJ. So this is where the court is supposed to look to find the relevant rules of international law, and these are the well-established sources of international law, of course, predating their uh, manifestation in the ICJ statute. So treaties or treaties, these are agreements between states or other subjects of international law with treaty-making capacity, for example, intergovernmental organizations, and these agreements are intended to be legally binding and governed by international law. Customary law, what's customary law? Uh, again, I realize most of you are probably familiar with it already, but just to, to reiterate, customary law rules of international law that emerge through the interaction of states over time. Generally, there are uh, agreed two elements of customary law, state practice and opinion juris, state practice what states do, opinion juris why they do it. So there's the objective element, the actual behavior of states, and opinion juris, the subjective element to the extent we can talk about a state having a sort of um, subjective mental state, this opinio juris, the idea that the state is engaging in the behavior out of a sense of legal obligation. You have these two elements, practice and opinio juris, you have a rule of customary international law. General principles of law, these are general legal principles that are recognized throughout all legal systems, very general uh, principles like equity and estoppel. Strictly speaking, there's no hierarchy among these three sources of international law. They're all on the same level. But as we'll talk about later, there are certain interpretive principles that are used to resolve conflicts, one being the later in time principle, another being the lex specialis principle. And applying these principles frequently, the treaty law will prevail over a conflict with customary law, but that won't always be the case. You have to apply these principles because these, there's no hierarchy among these sources of international law. You're probably also familiar with subsidiary means for determining rules of international law, court decisions, and scholarly writing. So those are not, of course, sources of international law, but basically evidence of one of these sources we see listed, treaties, customary law, or general principles. Treaties are binding only on states that are parties to the treaty, that is, that have expressed consent to be bound and for which the treaty has entered into force. Customary law binds all states with the possible exception of the so-called persistent objector, because we have, uh, in theory, a consent-based system. We have this possibility that a state can exempt itself from the application of a new rule of customary law by persistently objecting to it. So when we talk about the sources of human rights law obligations, we want to be for the fact that human rights law remains largely treaty-based. And this is a difference between human rights law and humanitarian law. Humanitarian law, the vast majority of the rules of humanitarian law have now evolved into customary international law. So it's of less importance whether a given state is a party to a particular IH treaty. That issue really only comes up in relation to certain provisions in protocols one and two, but certainly the four conventions, the Geneva Conventions of 1949, the Hague Conventions of 1907, are generally regarded now as entirely customary. So again, the question of treaty participation is less relevant. With human rights law, most human rights norms are still treaty-based and have not evolved into customary law. So the question of whether or not a given state is a party to a human rights treaty is highly relevant. Another point to remember about human rights law is that there are treaties both on the universal or UN level and also on the regional level. 
IHL, generally, you don't have much IHL on the regional level. These are all, for the most part, multilateral treaties open to all states and customary law binding all states. But for human rights treaties, you have extensive elaboration, adoption of treaties on the regional level. So you would want to be mindful of that if you're trying to figure out which rules of human rights law are binding a given state. You have to check which treaties it's a party to both on the universal level and also on the regional level. Now let's talk a little bit about the nature and scope of obligations under human rights law. To understand the nature and scope of human rights law and the obligations under human rights law, it's important to bear in mind the origins of the, of human rights law and even the, the basic structure of the international legal system. We have to remember that the traditional Westphalian system, post-1648 international legal system, conceived of the state as the exclusive subject of the positive law. So in our traditional system, only the state had rights and obligations. To the extent there was protection of individuals, individuals were protected by virtue of their nationality, and it was deemed to be the right of the state that was infringed if the individual was abused. So, of course, this would only be applicable where the abuser was a state other than the state of nationality. So, the so-called uh, law of state responsibility for injury to aliens, which is sort of a precursor to human rights law, but quite different in nature from human rights law. This body of law gave some protection to individuals, but it was completely at the discretion of their state of nationality. And again, would only be operable vis-a-vis -vis another state. So if A injures a national of state B, state B could espouse the claim on the international level because it was deemed to be an injury to state B, the individual being sort of the property of the state. And state A has inflicted property damage on the property of state B. Therefore, state B would have a claim against state A. Consent by state B, of course, would absolve state A of any wrongdoing. The paying of compensation would be paid by state A to state B, state B having no obligation to give it to the injured individual. So just bear this in mind as the, the, the traditional structure of the system to have a sense of how and why human rights law developed. Now, humanitarian law is much older than human rights law. Humanitarian law is very deeply embedded in this classical system. So if you look at the IHL treaties from prior to World War II, for example, the Hague Conventions of 1907, you see this classic structure of the international system embedded in the convention. So the, Hague the Fourth Hague Convention of 1907 would apply only to an interstate armed conflict and only where all the states that were parties to the conflict were also parties to that treaty. The Fourth Convention, the Fourth Hague Convention speaks exclusively in terms of the rights and obligations of states, nothing about the rights of individual human beings. So you see pretty clearly reflected this classical structure. And human rights law is a modern innovation. Human rights law, a post-World War II phenomenon, is a, is a body of international law that's distinct from the preceding rules of international law deviates from the classical system in that it purports to confer legal rights on individual human beings, right? Prior to World War II and the positivist system, the individual human being was not conceived of as a rights holder. So this was a major innovation post-World War II, the emergence of the individual human being as a subject of international law. But we also have to realize that the gap that was being filled by human rights law was regulation of the way a state treated its own people. So first and foremost, human rights law is about the way a state treats its own people, because this is something that was previously not regulated by international law. This is something that would fall within the non-intervention principle. So prior to World War II, it was not the business of other states how a state treated its own nationals on its territory. So the gap that human rights law filled was that gap, the regulation of a state, of a state's conduct vis-a-vis -vis its own people. So let's say a few words now about the scope of human rights obligations. We'll talk about the territorial issue a bit later in the presentation. And as you can imagine, territorial scope of application is going to be different for humanitarian law and human rights law, in part because of the nature of uh, sets of rules and why those rules evolve. But I want to talk a little bit about the substantive scope. What is the nature of the obligation imposed on the state? So under the ICCPR, we see there's an obligation to respect and ensure the rights of all those within the state's territory or under its jurisdiction. 
what does it mean to respect rights and to ensure rights? Well, this is generally interpreted as having two dimensions, a negative and a positive, so-called negative obligations and positive obligations. What's a negative obligation? A negative obligation is an obligation to refrain from doing something. Generally, it's an obligation of results. So the obligation to respect the right to be free from torture means the state can't torture people. If the state engages in torture, if a state official tortures someone, then the state has failed to respect its obligation to refrain from torturing. How about the obligation to ensure? The obligation to ensure is interpreted as a positive obligation, an obligation to ensure the right from interference by third parties, for example, other actors or agents of third states. So the obligation to ensure the right is a positive obligation on the state party to take steps to prevent and respond to human rights violations perpetrated by others. And it's now generally accepted that human rights law poses both types of obligations, a negative obligation on the state, an obligation of abstention, where the state party is obliged to refraining from interfering in rights, and also an obligation to ensure rights, a positive obligation. But it has to be proactive in taking steps to prevent and respond to human rights violations. Secondly, the role played by institutions. Another major difference between human rights law and humanitarian law is that there are many more human rights bodies than there are IHL bodies. Human rights, uh, there are, as you know, within the UN system, there's a proliferation of human rights institutions. We have treaty bodies, we have the charter bodies, we have the Human Rights Council and the special procedures of the Human Rights Council, special rapporteurs, working groups, thematic and geographic. So there are lots and lots of human rights institutions at the UN level, and there are also human rights institutions on the regional level. Now these institutions are, um, they have varying degrees of efficacy. So it's a system with many pressure points. And of course, human rights advocates need to use all of those pressure points because you get very limited relief from any given human rights body. On the other hand, in IHL, there are very few institutions that are monitoring and enforcing IHL. With the evolution of international criminal courts, We've now, we now have a fairly robust enforcement mechanism, but as I'm sure everybody knows, the jurisdiction of international criminal courts is quite narrow. And so uh, an obstacle to the enforcement of IHL would be the, the fairly narrow scope of the jurisdiction of these institutions. None of them have a worldwide or global jurisdiction. And why do I refer to international criminal law when I'm talking about enforcement of IHL? While these are in principle distinct and analytically distinct bodies of international law, of course, the largest category of international criminal law in the strict sense is war crimes. And what are war crimes? War crimes are criminal violations of IHL. So the most serious, the most uh, fundamental rules of IHL, the most serious violations will give rise to individual criminal responsibility, constituting war crimes, and therefore falling within international criminal uh, international criminal law in the strict sense and falling within the subject matter jurisdiction of international criminal courts. But again, there's still the issue of whether the court has jurisdiction over the individual perpetrator. And in, in, in the current state of international criminal law today, no court has a universal reach. So let's move on now about this question of the simultaneous application of human rights law and humanitarian law and why this matters well first of all the substance of human rights law is quite different from the substance of humanitarian law human rights law generally provides a higher degree of protection human rights law is applicable uh, of course in this time and because it is applicable in peacetime it gives a fairly high degree of protection in situations of armed conflict, we have this question of whether or not human rights law still applies. The majority position today is that, it, or I should say, the, the trend is in favor of co-application in times of armed conflict. But because human rights law is conceived of, first and foremost, as regulating the relationship between a state and its people in peacetime, it prov provides a fairly high degree of protection. So it's a very extensive catalog of rights that are provided. At the same time, human rights law is subject to derogation. So in times of emergency, a very serious emergency, in the words of Article 4 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights at, 
civil and political rights, an emergency that threatens the life of the nation. Well, in that situation, some of the rules of human rights law uh, can be derogated from by the particular state party to the extent necessary to meet the exigencies of the situation. But again, in general, human rights law is going to provide a higher level of protection. Hence, it's going to add substantive standards beyond those that are already provided in IHL, if human rights law, in fact, applies in a situation of armed conflict or occupation. In addition, if human rights law is applicable to a situation of armed conflict or occupation, it also brings into play all of the human rights monitoring bodies. So it's not just a question of the applicability of the substantive rules of human rights law, it's also a question of enforcement mechanisms and other monitoring and implementation mechanisms that are part and parcel of international human rights law. Then the various human rights treaty bodies will have to deal with situations arising under armed conflict or occupation insofar as the, the relevant treaty contains rules that, that govern the conduct. Um, so you have this different array of norms. You also have the issue of rights holders. And this is important. So under human rights law, the individual is the principal rights holder corresponding to obligations of state parties. Humanitarian law as an older body of law is not formulated, at least not to the same degree, in terms of rights of individuals. Again, if you look at the Hague Conventions pre-World War II, there was no mention of rights of individuals. It was all about rights and obligations of states. Post-World War II with the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and also the 1977 Protocols, we see increasingly the language of rights, rights of individuals within those treaties. But still, it's not principally formulated in terms of rights of individuals, whereas human rights law is principally formulated in terms of rights of individuals. So, oh, and with human rights law, remember, you also have treaties at the regional level. And so where you have, for example, coalitions, uh, armed forces from different states, it's going to be very important to look at all of the states participating because some of them may be bound by regional treaties in addition to the universal human rights treaties. And this can have implications for operations because it may be that the coalition then needs to, uh, to comply with the higher standards, whatever the highest standards are, binding on any one of the coalition partners. So if the US and the UK are coalition partners, the US may be indirectly bound by the obligations on the UK, not because the US is legally bound, but because of a practical, the practical matter of operating jointly means the US needs to adhere to the standards the UK is using, otherwise the UK could find itself hauled before the European Court of Human Rights. Human rights law and humanitarian law also have certain similarities. Of course, both of them are directed towards the protection of individuals. That's sort of the core similarity between human rights law and humanitarian law. And as humanitarian law evolves into a more individual rights-based body of law, its connection to human rights law becomes even stronger. But of course, significant differences remain. First and foremost, humanitarian law applies only in situations of armed conflict, armed, armed conflict or occupation. Human rights law applies principally in times of peace, applies fully in peacetime. And then there's this debate, the application of human rights law in times of armed conflict or occupation. The going consensus is yes, that it does, but bear in mind again that human rights law is subject to derogation. Humanitarian law is not subject to derogation because humanitarian law is designed to apply in an emergency situation. So it would, no, it would make no sense to say that some rules of humanitarian law are derogable in situations of public emergency. Okay, so let's move on now to the question of the relationship between human rights law and humanitarian law, this issue of simultaneous application of these two bodies of international law in situations of armed conflict or occupation. There's a growing consensus in favor of simultaneous application, but there's still some resistance on the part of states. Uh, some states the, and states that are major military powers, including the United States, for example. Why is there resistance to this notion? Perception is that human rights law is going to be more burdensome than IHL, and that human rights law leads to uh, basically compromising 
the state's ability to achieve its military objectives. So there's some resistance to the application of human rights law in times of armed conflict or occupation. In any event, there seems to be consensus on the principle that should be used to govern nation, a growing consensus that the lex specialis principle is the principle which should govern the relationship between these two bodies of law. But even though there is a growing consensus that the lex specialis principle is the relevant principle to employ, the interpretations of this principle or how this principle is operationalized, there's a tremendous divergence in approach. And in fact, we have, in the most extreme interpretations, the same gap as if we were to say some states completely reject the application of human rights law and humanitarian law. How is that? So? Well, the lex specialis principle, for example, had been invoked by the US. It, it does so less today, but it had been invoked by the US to say that the lex specialis principle, of course, means that the more specific rule uh, will override the more general rule in a situation where they conflict. But this was interpreted very broadly, basically to refer to the entire body of law. In other words, the US approach had been that in situations of armed conflict, humanitarian law was the lex specialis displacing human rights law entirely. And it would rely on this traditional dichotomy between the law of war and the law of peace, that essentially in time of war, the law of peace would cease to apply and the situation would be governed by the law of war. But of course, this is a pre-UN charter notion of international law. Analogizing though to this pre-charter body of law, the US would say, well, during armed conflict, IHL is the lex specialis, therefore human rights law ceases to apply. On the other end of the spectrum is the position that the specialis principle is merely an interpretive principle and that this principle is used to resolve conflicts only where you have a direct conflict in the law and a particular, with particular rules in relation to a particular set of facts. So you have an incredibly broad approach on one side with humanitarian law completely displacing human rights law. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have a very nuanced, very fact sensitive case specific analysis of the Lex Specialis principle. Uh, you're probably familiar with the example highlighted by the International Court of Justice back in the 90s and its advisory opinion on the threat or use of nuclear weapons. Uh, where the court talked about the example of the right to life and whether the uh, obligation under human rights law to respect and ensure the right to life was applicable in situations of armed conflict. Recognizing, of course, under IHL that it is not unlawful to kill enemy combatants. So something that would normally be murder under peacetime is not regarded as murder under the law of armed conflict, so long as the rules of IHL are complied with. You're not using prohibited weapons, the, uh, the enemy is an enemy combatant, they're a fighter, um, they are not or to combat, they're not being wounded or trying to surrender, then you have a killing that is not unlawful under IHL. So how do you reconcile that with the obligation to respect and ensure the right to life? The court basically says that the obligation to respect and ensure the right to life is to refrain from arbitrary deprivations of the right to life. And how does it determine what's arbitrary? Well, it says in a situation of armed conflict or occupation, you have to look at the rules of IHL to determine what is arbitrary. So you could say that this is a way of using the Lex Specialis principle as an interpretive principle. And instead of having one rule override the other rule, it's merely a way of interpreting the two rules so that they are harmonious, so that they don't conflict. That, the, that one rule is interpreted in light of the other rule to inform the interpretation of the other rule. Of course, another way of looking at this example, though, is that IHL essentially is replacing human rights law, because if the test for determining whether the right to life has been violated under human rights law is essentially just to use the rules of IHL, you could say, well, essentially, the rules of human rights law in this instance have been replaced by IHL. Now, the court has not said that this would be its approach across the board. And I think if the case came today, it would probably take a somewhat more nuanced approach. The, the court itself has backed away from this a bit in, for example, the advisory opinion on the wall that came out in 2004. And again, we're seeing uh, an, an increasingly more nuanced approach to this question of how the Lex Specialis should be interpreted and applied. 
In any event, there still remains some controversy about this issue of simultaneous application, but the controversy controversy is diminishing. I should say that the, there is more of a consensus that IHL, uh, that human rights law, at least in principle, applies in times of armed conflict or occupation. But nonetheless, there are still tremendous divergences in how this is operationalized. So, it, you know, even though on, on the surface it appears as though in consensus, in practice, there's still some significant divergences in approach. In addition to this question of whether uh, human rights law applies in armed conflict or occupation at all, you also have this issue of extraterritorial application. So if we're talking about an internal armed conflict, or if we're talking about conduct wholly within a single state, then the issue of extraterritori extraterritorial is going to arise. So in, an, in a civil war situation, you don't have to deal with this additional issue of extraterritorial application. However, if you're in a situation where conflict is spilling beyond the territory of a single state, or where you have you know, the uh, forces of one state operating on the territory of another state, this issue of extraterritorial application arises. Now for IHL, extraterritorial application is not controversial because remember IHL was originally trying to govern interstate armed conflicts. So naturally IHL will apply extraterritorially. First and foremost, it applies to a state's forces operating on the territory of another state. But if you recall, human rights law was designed to fill a certain gap the gap being the relationship between a state and its own people on its territory. That's not to say it exclusively regulates that, but that was the innovation of human rights law, that it would apply to the way a state treated its own people. Hence, you can see there might be some controversy about whether and to what extent states are bound by their human rights obligations in relation to individuals who are situated outside the territory of that state. And this is the issue of extraterritorial application of international human rights law. Again, there's some controversy around this. Uh, the reality is most states have not taken a position on this issue at all. You have some states that have, uh, that are in favor of extraterritorial application, and you have some states that reject extraterritorial application. So if we look, for example, at Article 2 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, we see the scope of application of that treaty. So Article 2 of the ICCPR, Paragraph 1, each state party to the present covenant undertakes to respect and to ensure to all individuals within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction the rights recognized in the present covenant without discrimination. Paraphrasing there at the end. Of course, we've already talked about this twin obligation to respect and to ensure, the obligation to refrain from violating rights, and also the obligation to proactively take steps to prevent and respond to human rights violations by others. But this obligation to respect and to ensure rights is not formulated as an obligation to respect and ensure the rights of everyone everywhere. The language of the treaty is the obligation is to respect and ensure the rights of all individuals within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction. So we have here a scope of application embedded in the language of Article 2. We see reflected what you could call a scope of rights holders, whose rights must be respected and ensured. Well, according to Article 2, all individuals within its territory, it being the state party, all individuals within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction. And here we see a divergence in interpretation. The U.S. approach and the approach of a few other states is that this language within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction sets forth two conditions that have to be met before an individual's rights uh, are to be respected and ensured, where there's an obligation on the state party to respect and ensure those rights. Those two conditions being first, that the individual be within the state's party's territory, and also that the individual be subject to the state's party's jurisdiction. Here you can see essentially a rejection of extraterritorial application, because according to this position, in order for an individual to have rights vis-a-vis -a, -vis a state party under the covenant, that individual must be within the sovereign territory of that state. It's not sufficient to be under the state party's jurisdiction because both conditions have to be met. 
An alternative interpretation of Article 2, and this is an interpretation advanced by the Human Rights Committee and also by the World Court, the ICJ, is that this word and, so the conjunction between territory and jurisdiction, does not mean that both conditions should be met. Instead, and here is acting as an aggregator. It's not just taking the intersection of those within the territory and those subject to the state's party's jurisdiction. It's aggregating those two categories so that the obligation to respect and ensure rights applies to all individuals that are within the state's party's territory and also to all individuals that are within the state party's jurisdiction. So according to this perspective, the word and brings together both categories of individuals so that it would be sufficient if an individual is within a state party's territory or for that individual to be uh, subject to the state party's jurisdiction in order for it to have, for that individual to have rights under the covenant. So we see this issue arise at Guantanamo Bay, for example, um, or individuals who are in the custody of coalition forces in Iraq or Afghanistan. These individuals are clearly subject to the jurisdiction of those states, but they're not within the sovereign territory. The U.S. person is, well, since they're not in U.S. sovereign territory, they do not have rights under the covenant vis-a-vis -vis the United States. The ICJ position, the Human Rights Committee's position is, well, as long as they're under the jurisdiction of the U.S., that's sufficient to bring them within the scope of rights holders under the ICCPR. This controversy continues. Uh, but again, there's a trend towards the acceptance of extraterritorial application of human rights law. And I should also say there's a difference here between treaty law and customary law. It's an easier argument to make that customary human rights law applies everywhere, whereas treaty law is governed, of course, and foremost by the terms of that particular treaty. And in the ICCPR, we see that there are different interpretations of Article 2. Um, the Article 2, it's, it's difficult to reconcile those two different interpretations of Article 2, and certainly the U.S. interpretation is not uh, an irrational interpretation of the language of Article 2. The U.S. grounds its interpretation is in the basic rules on interpretation of treaties under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, with the U.S. saying, look, treaties are to be, uh, the words in a treaty are to be given their ordinary meaning. And so the U.S. says the ordinary meaning of the word and, and, that both conditions, condition A and condition B, have to be met. Of course, those who disagree with that interpretation place more emphasis on teleological interpretation, because a part of that primary rule of treaty interpretation is not just that words be given an ordinary meaning, but they give, be, be given that meaning in context and in light of the treaty's object and purpose. So those who advance a broader interpretation of Article 2 will certainly endorse uh, this broader, uh, will use this teleological interpretation focusing on the object and purpose of the treaty. If we look at the travel, the travel are not so helpful as is frequently the case in any multilateral treaty negotiation, but there is some support for the U.S. position in the drafting history of the treaty, which the U.S. will frequently cite in its correspondence with the Human Rights Committee, the treaty body, on its implementation of the ICCPR. Nonetheless, we've seen movements towards consensus on this issue. Um, it's still not, let's say, it's still not settled as far as the uh, community of states parties is concerned. Again, for international courts, it seems to be more or less settled, but you know, in the international legal system, courts do not necessarily have the final say. Um, it is well settled within the Council of Europe system, because there you have a very robust uh, regional court, the European Court of Human Rights. But bear in mind also that the European Court of Human Rights is applying the European Convention, and the European Convention does not use the word territory. The obligation under Article 1 of the European Convention is to secure the rights of all those within the state's party's jurisdiction, no mention of the word territory. So in a way, it's easier for the European Court to find the European Convention applicable extraterritorially in a way that it, it's harder than to find the ICCPR applicable extraterritorially, again, because of the different language and the scope of application provision in that treaty. So that's essentially the issue of extraterritorial application. Uh, 
ultimately then we see there's trend towards acceptance of simultaneous applications, a trend towards extraterritorial application, or an additional wrinkle that one would have to consider is if you're in a multilateral operation, for example, if there's peacekeeping forces, you may also have an issue of attribution. What's attribution? It's a question of to which state is the conduct of an individual or other entity uh, attributable? so that we can talk about state responsibility. For UN peacekeeping forces, this question of to whom that conduct is attributable is can be quite tricky, whether or not the peacekeeper who may be of French nationality, are they acting on behalf of the UN or are they acting on behalf of France? Or, and this has implications not just for who's responsible for the conduct, but it can also have implications for whether or not that what the applicable law is. So, for example, if the individual is acting on behalf of the UN and not on behalf of France, then the conduct is not governed by the European Convention, because the European Convention is the conduct of France, not of the individual French soldier who may be acting on behalf of the UN. And together with this question of law, you have the question of jurisdiction. Again, if that individual is not acting on behalf of a state that's a party to the European Convention, even if they're that state's national and ordinarily part of their armed forces, then the European Court of Human Rights would, for example, not have jurisdiction over the state because the individual is not acting on behalf of the state at the time. So let's see, Beth, am I missing anything? Is there... No, thank you very much, John. That was a, a very helpful exposition of what can be a very complicated legal topic. Uh, we have a number of very interesting questions that have come in during this session. I'd like to begin, however, with a question that um, I'm seeing threads of in, in a number of questions. So if you'll allow me, um, I will represent um, a few questions here. And that is, John, could you speak a bit to the practical relevance of this question? Um, we did a very good job of investigating sort of some of the legal um, questions here, but could you give perhaps an example or two of why does this matter for those who are operating in situations of armed conflict, perhaps for a humanitarian or someone working in the field of human rights advocacy? Um, could you help us understand the practical consequences of this question? Sure. I mean, one reason in which it matters is the applicable rules are different. So, for example, um, there are a number of rights that you'll find in human rights law that simply don't exist under the law of armed conflict or are not formulated in terms of rights under the law of armed conflict. So, especially if you're looking at economic and social rights, then you have the whole spectrum, for example, of the education, rights of education and access to health care, um, rights that you won't see set forth as rights under the law of armed conflict, but instead are referred to indirectly as types of obligations on states. Uh, you also have the, the whole question of detention, right? Detention regimes under human rights law and humanitarian law are also quite different. So under IHL, of course, you can detain individuals, uh, enemy combatants for the duration of the hostilities. Uh, for civilians, there are security justifications for detention with uh, periodic review, but nothing like the level of protection that you would have under human rights law. So whether human rights law would apply, if human rights law applies, it's going to give more protection. But bear in mind, of course, that certain rules under human rights law are derogable. So if the state party can justify it as necessary, it can derogate from some obligation in rights law and certainly uh, freedom from arbitrary detention and fair trial rights are among the derogable rights. There's been some pushback this by the Human Rights Committee. The Human Rights Committee in its general comments has tried to say that even though some rights may in principle be derogable in situations of armed conflict or occupation, it has uh, essentially narrowed, tried to narrow the state's party's ability to, to derogate from those obligations. So, for example, uh, access to court to challenge the legality of detention, you know, whether in a common law system is the rid of habeas corpus. The, uh, the Human Rights Committee has said that that right, even though it's it looks to be derogable under the text of the ICCPR, is in fact not derogable where it's necessary to secure other rights under the that are non-derogable. Great. Thank you very much, John. 
We have another excellent question coming in from Bob. And Bob asks, could you please explain a bit about the interaction between IHL and human rights with regards to the situation of occupation and how this might play out during periods of armed escalation during an occupation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in a situation of occupation, it's, uh, I'm glad you brought this up because there's another basis for finding human rights law applicable in a situation of occupation, and this helps uh, avoid the extraterritoriality issue. So if we look at the ICJ judgment in Congo versus Uganda, they find human rights law not just on the basis of extraterritorial application of human rights treaties, but also they read human rights law into the law of occupation where the Hague regulations require the occupying power to respect the law in force, while the law in force, according to the ICJ, includes human rights law. So in a situation of occupation, you actually have another uh, avenue for the application of human rights law. Uh, and on the extraterritoriality issue, I should say for the Human Rights Committee and for the ICJ, the paradigm case for extraterritorial application of human rights law would be situation of occupation. Um, those who challenge the extraterritorial application of human rights law will say, well, human rights law presumes territorial control and therefore it should not apply extraterritorially. Well, of course, in a situation of occupation, the occupying power, in fact, has territorial control. Um, and in fact, you know, one of the emerging trends in the acceptance of extraterritorial application is to distinguish between negative and positive obligations, with negative obligations applicable everywhere, positive obligations applicable only where state is in a situation of territorial control. So, for example, in a situation of occupation. Well, what happens if there's an occupation that's relatively calm, but then hostilities bubble up somewhere? This uh, goes to issue of the rules of the conduct of hostilities and when they begin to apply again. So in a situation of calm occupation, uh, there's a growing consensus that the rules regulating the use of force, for example, should be the rules under human rights law and that a law enforcement approach should be taken. That is, force can only be used when strictly necessary, lethal force could only be used when strictly necessary. Of course, under the conduct of hostilities rules of law of armed conflict, uh, lethal force, that you don't have to have a ratcheting up of force. It's You can just intentionally kill any combatants, even if that combatant doesn't pose an immediate threat, right? So under the conduct of hostilities, it's not unlawful to kill an enemy combatant in the situation where that poses no threat, so long as they're not or to combat at the time that you're targeting them. Under human rights law, of course, you can't have that kind of targeted killing. So, um, which Tom occupation, there's a growing consensus that it should be human rights law that governs, not the rules of the conduct of hostilities under IHL. But of course, if you have hostilities break out and the occupation is no longer a calm occupation, and you once again have a system, of, uh, have a, a situation of active armed conflict, the conduct of hostilities rules would kick in again, and then you have this uh, interrelationship question. But I think most would agree that the conduct hostilities would then regulate killing, targeting and killing. Excellent. Thank you, John. Another interesting question that just came in from Agnesa. She says, I work with an organization that engages with armed groups. Sometimes we have to act in situations that may fall below the threshold of armed conflict. So in other words, situations to which just human rights law apply. Groups in this case may still control territory. Might they also have human rights obligations? Mm. Okay, yeah, another tricky question. Strictly speaking, the duty bearer under human rights law in the strict sense uh, is the state. So if you're dealing with a non-state group, they are not as such bound by rules of human rights law in the strict sense. And again, I'm using the term human rights law in the strict sense to distinguish it from relevant rules of IHL or international criminal law in the strict sense. IHL, of course, binds not just the state, but also organized armed groups. Um, and international criminal law binds individual human beings. But if we're talking about human rights law in the strict sense, and certainly if this is a situation short of armed conflict, then there is no application of IHL. Uh, human rights law in the strict sense 
binds only the state, imposes legal obligations only on the state. International criminal law, in this sense, of course, contains categories of crime other than war crimes. So you don't need to have a situation of armed conflict for the rule prohibiting crimes against humanity and genocide to be applicable. So individuals can still be held legally responsible under international law for conduct outside of an armed conflict if the conduct rises to the level of a crime against humanity or genocide. But if you're talking about human rights law in the strict sense, then the state is the duty bearer. Well, can the state be responsible for the conduct of a non-state actor? Certainly that's possible. We'd have to look to the rules of attribution for that. And the rules of attribution that I referenced before are part of the uh, law of state responsibility and sort of framework rules of international law. And in some instances, the conduct of non-state actors may be attributable to the state. Also, of course, the state itself is responsible to ensure the rights of those within its jurisdiction. So the state of that territory has an obligation to take steps to prevent and respond to human rights violations perpetrated by the non-state actor. Now, generally, of course, if this is an insurgent group, the state is already trying to vanquish the rebel group, right? So uh, generally, they're already exercising due diligence, so to speak, to uh, stop any violations perpetrated by that organization, and presumably they are unable to do so by the very fact that this group controls territory. But it's worth pointing out that there is an obligation on the state to prevent and respond to human rights violations by this group, and not just to regain territorial control or otherwise defeat the group. Is it possible that the uh, the conduct of the non-state actor be attributable to the state, again, so that we'd be in the realm of negative obligations, where the state is failing to respect rights because the state is actually responsible for the conduct perpetrated by the non-state actor. Well, certainly if this non-state actor is in fact acting on the instructions direction or under the control of the state, you would have attribution. You would have attribution where the state subsequently adopts the conduct of the non-state actor. But also if that rebel group were to become the government of the state. So if the non-state actor succeeds in taking over and becomes the government of that state, or if they secede and become the government of a new state, their conduct is attributable to that state. And then we, again, we're in the realm of human rights law and uh, state responsibility for violations of human rights obligations. Because again, the conduct of the non-state group becomes the state if they successfully become the government of the state. And again, when you have human rights law and you have state responsibility, you also have remedies against the state, either through the human rights treaty bodies or the charter bodies or where applicable uh, relevant regional human rights institutions. Great, thank you very much, John. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity, if you'll allow me to um, ask a general question that um, represents a few queries that have come in. Um, in particular, we have a question from Ahmed and from Fatalu, who have asked essentially, how does IGEL and human rights apply in Syria at this point, as well as to the current crisis within Europe and at its border? So John, could you very briefly review the applicability of IGEL and human rights to this situation for us? Sure. Um, as for the situation in Syria, Syria is a party to the vast majority of human rights treaties on a universal level. So in terms of applicable law, virtually all of human rights law applies in Syria. Now again, Syria, uh, sorry, human rights law is binding on the state. So we're talking about obligations of Syria under human rights law. Then there's the question of ISIS and the extent to which ISIS is, has, is purporting to be a state and in control of territory. Well, I don't think we're at the point where ISIS can be considered a state because even if ISIS manages to satisfy the Montevideo criteria, uh, states are not going to recognize it as a state. So it remains that Syria is the duty bearer under international human rights law and that ISIS is not. Um, with respect to the uh, possibility of derogation, certainly Syria is in a situation of public emergency. So Syria could derogate from some of its obligations under human rights law, those obligations which are derogable, but only to the extent necessary. Now, a question comes up when we talk about derogation under human rights law. One could say, well, 
can a state avail itself of this facility derogation if the state is the one that caused the emergency situation? So this question arose in the Libya context when um, in response to protests, the Libyan government cracked down very heavily. Uh, and there was, of course, a situation of emergency, but one could argue that it was the Libyan government that caused the state of emergency. Whether uh, or not a state should be, avail it's, should be able to avail itself of this facility of derogation, well, it's, it's questionable whether a state should be. Well, certainly they should not be able to, but legally, can they? It's not clear. The practice of the Human Rights Committee has been to be fairly deferential to states when they invoke a state of emergency. So Syria certainly could say this is a situation of emergency that threatens the nation and therefore derogate from its obligations under the covenant. But where there can be scrutiny is with each measure of derogation to examine whether that particular measure is necessary. So instead of focusing on whether or not there is a state of emergency, it may be more fruitful to look at every measure derogating from obligations under the covenant to see if that particular measure is necessary in order to meet the exigence of the situation. Uh, certainly IHL is applicable in Syria as well. Then you have the question of is this non-international armed conflict to what extent has it become international armed conflict and that of course has a bearing on which rules of IHL will be applicable to the situation. As for the situation uh, in Europe, the current uh, migrant crisis, and I, I should use, say that I'm using the term migrant in a general sense to describe people on the move. I'm using it without prejudice to any other legal status these individuals might have under international law, whether it be refugee or a trafficking victim. And you know, bear in mind that these categories are not mutually exclusive, but I'm going to use the general term migrant without prejudice to any other status that these individuals might have. Um, in relation to the migration crisis, the IHL issues, I mean, it's, it's really more of a refugee law, a human rights law situation than an IHL situation in Europe. Now, of course, the reason that many of these people are on the move is because of serious IHL violations and violations of international criminal law in the countries that they're coming from. So there is that IHL piece. The IHL has less to say about these individuals once they are away from the theater of conflict. And in fact, if we're talking about issues of displacement, bear in mind that IHL, some forms of displacement of civilians is permissible. There are security grounds for displacing civilians. Um, there are obligations attendant to that as well. But you know, there can be evacuations and other types of displacements of the civilian population population that are permissible under the rules of IHL. Again, with respect to the situation in Europe now, IHL is a little bit uh, less relevant to their current situation as opposed to, again, why they are on the move in the first place. Uh, in terms of the situation in Europe, the, there are certainly human rights issues uh, bearing in mind that if we're talking about economic and social rights and humanitarian needs of these people in Europe, we're talking largely about positive obligations, positive obligations that are governed by a best efforts standard as opposed to negative obligations, right? So states have an obligation to exercise due diligence to help people have access to healthcare and education, et cetera, uh, adequate standards of living. But uh, it's not an obligation of result. It's not a negative obligation. To the extent we're in the realm of negative obligations under human rights law, the biggest issue there is excessive uses of force. So as you, as countries close their borders and as you have a buildup of more and more people uh, at the border, and to the extent it becomes a security situation from the state's perspective, there's the prospect of the state using force and using excessive force. And then, of course, we're in the realm of negative obligations, right, with the state failing to, um, to, to respect the right, the right to life or the right to personal security or the right to be free of cruel and human or degrading treatment or punishment. So then all of those human rights rules become relevant.
All right. Thank you very much, John. I think with that and keeping an eye on the time, uh, we will have to conclude today's session. Um, I'd like to thank the participants for joining us today. And for those of you who have submitted questions, there are a number of incredibly good questions uh, still in the Q&A from people like Paula and Ruba Zagagi and uh, Ahmed and Patricia and Claire. And what we're going to try to do is to address these questions online at the PHAP website. So we um, encourage you to check back on the PHAP website uh, where we'll do our best to address these questions. But also a number of these questions will also be addressed in our upcoming sessions. So I would encourage you to join us um, for those and I will announce those shortly. For those of you who are interested, uh, please join us for the assessment immediately following this uh, session. The assessment code that you need to access this is 9625. Again, that is 9625 if you're interested in taking the assessment. Similarly, um, the recording resources and uh, assessments to previous sessions are all available on the PHAP website. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the PHAP team. I have Marcus Forsberg and Saranjana Das, uh, who supported today's event, and also a very warm welcome, a very warm thank you to John for joining us for today's event. Um, in terms of the calendar for next sessions, um, we have on the 29th of September, a discussion of international criminal law. And on the 14th of October, we'll be looking into the concept of direct participation in hostilities. I'd also like to flag for those of you uh, for whom this might be of interest, uh, PHAP has in September and October, PHAP is organizing a special series of online discussions structured around the principles of humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. This is part of PHAP's support to the World Humanitarian Summit process. And the aim of these sessions is to build a solid understanding of the dilemmas that principled humanitarian actors may face. In addition to these sessions, um, there will also be one on October 8th that PHAP is holding in conjunction with Norwegian Refugee uh, Council and Handicap International, and that's entitled The Realities of Being Principled in Today's Field Operations. So we'd encourage you to join us for a number of very interesting upcoming sessions, as well as to visit the PHAP website for any sessions that you may have missed uh, in the months um, that have passed. And so with that, I wish everyone a, a very pleasant morning, afternoon, and good evening, and hope to see you again online soon.